Ask it. Ask it. Ask it. Ask it. Ask it. Welcome to the Ask It podcast. The Ask It podcast encourages talking about talking, facilitates your own inner wisdom, and rather than providing answers, considers good questions. So welcome, wise ones. Today we welcome Dr. Lucy Johnston, who is a clinical psychologist, speaker and trainer. And today we're asking the question, do we really need a diagnostic model of distress? So welcome, Lucy. Thank, Thank you for you. being Thank here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so could you just tell us a little bit about your background, what led you to this point, um, and how you came to be doing all this research and, and getting this framework together? Okay, so I'm a clinical psychologist, as you said. Um, I've worked for many years in adult mental health settings. Um, along with some academic posts and training posts. So I have a very long-standing interest in what we now refer to as mental health. And I also have a very long-standing kind of critical perspective on the ways we're encouraged to understand emotional distress on the diagnostic model. So it's been a <clears throat> theme of my career really to criticise some of the unhelpful aspects of the approaches we do have and try and develop alternatives and put them into practice in clinical work and develop training on them and write on them and so on. And we're going to talk about some of those ideas, I think. And um, we're also going to talk about the Power Threat Meaning Framework, which is a jointly produced um, project, um, which is in some ways a culmination of all the work that I and my co-authors have done to date. So, uh, so I'll put some links at the bottom. But, um, yep. That's the that's the easy read version. The, there will be a link to the website which has the original documents, which are actually quite long and dense. OK, but if you can afford 12 quid, you can get the easy read version, which is that. one. <laughs> OK, so what do you feel in essence is wrong with the existing diagnostic model? OK, so in essence, as um, clinicians, patients or service users, indeed as a whole society, we have uncritically accepted the idea that people in various forms of distress, which are very, very real, absolutely real, overwhelming, agonizing experiences people go through, are suffering from something like, you know, a form of medical illness. That's, it, it seems almost too obvious to question it sometimes. I think because people just accept that as true you know that we have the term mental illness we have all these labels like bipolar disorder and personality disorder and psychosis and schizophrenia and major depressive disorder and so on but there has never actually been any evidence that these very real emotional experiences are best understood in the same way as we understand things that go wrong in our bodies which result diagnoses of whatever you know diabetes or broken legs or various forms of cancer or whatever although that, that analogy is often used isn't it it's like diabetes or it's as real as a broken leg and I think most people do not realize how little evidence there is to support that approach and how much evidence there is for alternative approaches which essentially are about understanding people's distress as arising in the context of their lives in a sense, as being a meaningful response to what you've been through and the sense you've made of it. Yeah. So fundamentally false analogy is what I would say and what a growing number of other people are also saying. Yeah, and I, I mean, this isn't the whole story, it's just one aspect of it. But I wonder, it seems to me that um, psychotherapy, talking therapies, counselling, psychology, They've, it's very much an art because if you think about the human being we are tendencies to behave aren't we we're dynamic and depending on who we're with brings out different aspects of us what setting we're in might bring out mm. different aspects of us so it's an art really mm. to be working with that and I think we've tried as a profession we've tried to give ourselves more scientific substance as it were mm. by joining this idea of breaking things down into parts and 
analysis and and it's it's a very reducing well I, I agree with that I agree with that I mean you're a therapist I'm spent a lot of my time working as a therapist and it's you know any branch of life can draw on scientific findings but actually it's far more art than science and it's about relationships it's about intuition it's about empathy and it's about being in the room as a human being with another human being and I think my own profession you know my own discipline of psychology has been very guilty of trying to turn psychology into a science in ways which haven't really been helpful and don't really fit subject matter which as I say, it's not to say we ignore evidence and there's, you know, there's no purpose in adopting that perspective sometimes, but that doesn't fundamentally suit the nature of the, you know, the phenomena we're dealing with, in my view. Yeah, and one of the earliest things I was taught in my training was to be, was to allow yourself to be fascinated by the story of the other, mm. by the narrative of the other. Yeah. Um, and literally seeing the world through their eyes. And yeah. I think that really gets lost um, in, the, in the diagnostic model. Well, it does. If you apply a label, the trouble is you stop asking questions. You then treat the illness and the person and their story tends to vanish. That's probably the, one of the most damaging effects of diagnosis, that it obscures people's meanings, it obscures people's stories, it obscures their life contexts. And very, very simply, what I've argued for throughout my career and serve a number of other people is that instead of diagnostic understandings, we need understandings that are based on stories and narratives. Actually, that's what we need to do in order to understand people in their context and help to find ways forward which actually are healing. Rather than, as so often happens, people getting trapped in a kind of mental patient, mental illness, psychiatric system role, which can in many cases last a lifetime you know it's not uncommon to find people who've been coming in and out of services for 20 30 40 50 years you know there has to be something badly wrong if that's often what's happening so how did you begin to move from seeing the holes if you like seeing what you felt wasn't working to move into an idea of okay what might be a different way to be looking at this um, well, I think I've always seen it like that. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've, I've done quite a few podcasts by now. So one of the things I quite often say is, well, I started reading psychology and psychotherapy group books at a very unhealthily early age, like about 12. <laughs> so, I mean, my worldview was always, you know, people suffer for reasons. And that includes the kinds of suffering we call mental illness. So I've never bought that model at all. And I went into clinical psychology training partly because I was really interested in challenging the mental illness model and you know thinking about alternatives but um, once I I mean I guess one of my initial areas of interest was this idea of formulation which is a common idea in psychology which is a particular way of constructing a story so spent quite a lot of my career kind of developing formulation as an idea, as a, as a way of practicing. And, you know, there are a number of other people doing the same, of course, and I invent this term, but actually in recent years, it's become a very popular widespread notion such that a number of professions are saying they do formulation too. Sometimes that's accurate, sometimes it isn't. And I think all professions should be starting from that perspective. At, at the moment, it's you know, it is psychology, clinical psychologists who are mostly talking about formulation practice. It's thoroughly embedded in our training. I used to be head of a clinical psychology training course. So, you know, it is the absolute heart and core of clinical psychologists training. And, you know, I'm pleased to see that this idea is, you know, taking hold elsewhere as well. So it's a relatively common term to hear in services. And from my travels around the world, it seems to me that this is virtually <laughs> The only phenomenon you know you, you don't hear people talking the same way in any other country that I've come across and we're actually seen in the UK as being quite pioneers in this sense now formulation isn't the only way of looking at people's stories in a very general sense all therapy as you've just said is about looking at people's stories 
but it's a way of sort of formalizing that, structuring that in a way that I think does have some particular advantages within mental health services. Yeah, so in my very slightly different world of counselling and psychotherapy, I think mm. traditionally it was really just the CBT therapists that, mm. that did a structured kind of yeah. formulation. Mm. And you, do, you don't, I have lots of students that come to me on placements from different trainings, um, and, and you don't really he hear them talk uh, about formulation. I mean, obviously, as you said, we all do it naturally. Yeah, um, yeah, by doing an assessment yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was really only CBT that was really doing a formula formulation structured formulation so for those people that aren't so familiar with doing that in a structured way can you just give a very brief overview of what you mean by that okay I'll also put a link to my co-edited book on formulation in psychology and psychotherapy in case anyone's interested so um, you're right, there's a strong tradition of formulation in CBT. And the way I think about formulation is in a more generic sense, which would include some CBT perspectives, but would be wider than that. So it seems to me that um, actually to do decent work with most of the clients we see, we need to have nearly always a broader perspective than a single model one. So I'm kind of in favor of an integrative approach to formulation, if I had to put a label on it, I would say a trauma-informed one. But in essence, what a formulation is, is it looks a bit like a few paragraphs, or if it's a CBT formulation, it often looks like a diagram. And it's based on two forms of evidence. One is what the professional knows from the research, from their clinical experience, and so on. The other equally important source of evidence is what the client brings to the room about what happened to them and the sense they made of it and how it's affected them. And you can put these two things together into a kind of very personal narrative, or in a way, it's a kind of a very personal hypothesis. I, I usually use the word best guess. It's our joint best guess, our joint hypothesis. You want to make it sound more important about the reasons, for, you know, the possible reasons for your distress. And if this is at least accurate to some extent, it should help us to think about the best way forward. So the main purpose is to, well, there's a number of purposes, one of which is to kind of make sure we're on the same page and to build a sense of trust and sh shared understanding between client and therapist and so on. But in some ways, the main purpose is to think, well, if this, more, if this is more or less accurate, what would help us? you know, what would help you to move forward. And like any hypothesis, you would revisit it. You'd think, well, we've got so far, we seem to have got, got a bit stuck, perhaps we need to revisit the formulation and so on. And in contrast to a diagnosis, then a formulation is something that you do together. You're both experts in it. And it's not something you can impose on someone. You know, it's, it's something that you both contribute to, both take responsibility for. It's not set in stone. It's always evolving. It's collaborative yeah. rather than this kind of power imbalance of, well, you're there, I'm going to analyse you, diagnose you and tell you what's wrong. It's much more co-created and collaborative. If it's done well, yes. Yeah. I wouldn't have to say that no one ever does it badly and that no one ever comes in with their own ideas and tries to impose it on someone else. But if it's done well, yes, it's, it's done as it should be. Yeah. So what do we mean when we talk about... Um, a trauma-informed model. Okay, so that the trauma-informed model is something I only became aware of, I mean, relatively recently, about sort of, I don't know, 2008, 2009 or something like that, though it's been around for a while. It originates from a very um, important set of studies in America in the 1990s called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Studies, the ACE studies, which I'm sure many people have heard of, which I mean, in essence, were, were demonstrating something that any decent clinician knows anyway, that difficult events, particularly those that happen early in our lives, have long-term effects on what we might call our mental health, as well as on all sorts of other areas of our lives, like our physical health and our educational outcomes and all sorts of other things. So it's very powerful evidence that we need to be thinking about psychosocial causes of mental health problems and you know trauma-informed practice can be 
understood and translated into practice in various ways. But I mean, classically, it's a kind of there's a kind of three stage model, if you like. The first stage is working with someone to help them see to see if it makes sense to see their problems in this way. So this is what went on when you were growing up, and this is what how you tried to survive it, and so on. And then to introduce various ways of helping the person to get a bit better control of their feelings, their life, their reactions, and so on. Stabilization is the jargon term. So the idea is you need to feel, introduce some safety into your life. And at that point, some people will be ready and willing to perhaps undergo some kind of therapy, which could take numerous forms, individual group, you can get trauma-informed therapy can come under various brand names nowadays. Um, and you would hope that eventually someone works through to a stage where they can take up the reins of their life again, and sometimes in a rather different way, you know, because they are in a very different position, we hope, from when they started. So a trauma-informed formulation would be based on a really thorough knowledge and awareness of that research and that body of clinical practice. So it would be looking at the things that we might call traumas in your life and the way they've um, affected you as you've been growing up and as you've been trying to manage them and live alongside them. And uh, what occurs to me as I listen to you is that's actually a very, uh, when we do an assessment, the way we ask questions necessarily will elicit the way that those are answered and, and yeah. elicit different information. So. On a standard assessment, I suppose, a traditional sort of assessment, you'd be asking about childhood, schooling, was there any bullying, this, this, that and the other. Mm. So it would include those traumatic events. I think it's very different. Often what I do with uh, the people I work with is I say to them, let's do a, a timeline of your life, but let's look at it from a trauma point of view. Mm -hmm. And you get completely different information <clears throat> and it, oftentimes a completely different perspective by just looking at that history very differently yeah you do I mean you have to be able to be open to hear trauma before people will tell you about it yeah. you know? and, and that is a very different perspective and I mean all mental health staff are currently meant to be you know in England anyway Department of Health has issued guidance saying all mental health staff should be asking about trauma at first assessment and that very often doesn't happen and of course it often takes trust and time for someone to disclose so you, you shouldn't just do that and think you've done it nor should you just do that look at it and put it in the notes and forget about it it should lead to a sensitive and appropriate approach so disclosure training helps you to ask those kind of questions in a, in a, in a gentle way in, in a tactful way that is more than a tick box exercise and that does actually give people the opportunity to speak often for the first time. Yeah, and, and I was listening to some of your lectures on YouTube. Um, and one of the things I, I really liked that stood out for me, it's such a simple thing. You were talking about spending time and, and, and this evolving over a matter of weeks, sometimes mm -hmm. even months. And of course, in our in our modern day world, particularly uh, with the rise of CBT historically, mm. Mm. evidence based, you know, brief intervention. This is the, the latest wonder therapy, and we can do it in six weeks. And yeah. you can't work with trauma in six weeks because, for one thing, the patient might take ages and ages and ages to even reveal something, yeah. you know, because it's so deeply painful. It, it doesn't make sense at all. I mean, it's kind of like assembly line therapy, isn't it? Yeah. Medical model psychology, I call it. And it's, you know, it is the basis on which services like IAPT have been set up. And I think IAPT has some good things to offer, but I was reading a long thread on the UK Clinical Psychology Facebook group only last night about people's immense frustrating, frustration at only being, you know, commissioned to offer six to eight sessions and some services actually saying, if someone discloses historical abuse, then we say you're not suitable for IAPT. And so, so they're sent away again. I mean, you know, what, what, what does IAPT think people are coming along distressed about? <laughs> There's very few people who haven't had difficult events in their lives, which 
to them were traumatic and problematic and that's why they're distressed so I, yeah. you know I have criticisms of psychiatry but I have plenty of criticisms of psychology as well on that kind of narrow psychological approach which fits with what we were talking about earlier it fits with the desire to be seen as a science and to be evidence-based in what I would say is a very narrow way and that's the end result. Yeah. And in a way there's a double-edged sword to, to, to brief intervention in that way because you know it is it is very dangerous and unethical maybe to open up a deeply traumatic experience when you know you've got to end in six to eight session but then as you say that's all fair, well and good, but what you you're not referring them on to anything. They're just dropping into a into a hole most of the time. So well, they, yeah, I know. I mean, it, it, you know, it's horrible. This was the discussion was going on in the thread, mm. and uh, one of the places I worked a few years ago in secondary mental care, mental health care, where these not suitable for out people may be referred, yeah. had a, a kind of similar rule, which is even in cases that they might diagnose as, you know, psychosis or personality disorder, if they disclosed a history of abuse, then the, the way of thinking would be, oh, well, abuse reactions aren't mental illness, so we don't take them on, so it's like, nobody wants, nobody wants this stuff. And that's very characteristic of the whole dynamics around trauma, I think. It's like, nobody wants to listen, nobody wants to hear, nobody wants to sit in a room and actually be with someone else talking about some extremely extremely personal difficult things we don't want to know about it at the service we don't want to know about it as a society and I think this is changing a little bit in that you know horrific as it's been to hear about all the scandals to do with children's homes and the catholic church and Jimmy Savile and all that kind of stuff the fact that these things have emerged I think does suggest to me there's a little bit more willingness to acknowledge as a society what's going on but it's it's always an ongoing battle there's always a desire to, to silence to cover up to to look the other way to stick a diagnostic label on because then we don't have to look too closely yeah and you know without becoming too political about um, it you know what what should be political <laughs> about it <laughs> <laughs> what i what i get really frustrated by is Year on year, we're told we're going to put more money into mental health. We're going to prioritise mental health. Uh, you know, we have various amount of NHS different documents I've through about you know what the plan to put into action, and that it just never seems to manifest, Lucy. Well, it's it's money for the wrong reasons, isn't it? I mean, we don't want more money for more of the same. Because to put it bluntly, what we have is creating patients, not curing them. Yes. So, you know, we don't need more pills and, you know, more doctors and maybe we don't even need more psychologists. I don't know. We need something fundamentally different. We need more of the same will not work. And I hear everybody repeating this mantra. And it, I mean, it does drive me up the wall, I have to say, because it's, you know, it's, it's just a waste of resources. So it's all cash strapped of course people are undervalued and mostly underpaid but actually the problem isn't that we need more money it's that we have a fundamentally different a fundamentally mistaken way of understanding things yeah so how do we move into the power threat meaning framework then all oh, right well <laughs> the glorious future that may lie ahead of us <laughs> let's hope <laughs> Well, OK, so the Power Threat Meaning Framework is a very, very ambitious project, um, which, start, which took a group of us five years to complete. And what I sometimes say is it's just like having children. If you knew what you were going to have to go through, you'd probably never do it. So it's just as we <laughs> because none of us regret having our lovely kids and uh, we don't regret producing the framework. So it started in... 2012, um, when a group of us who've known each other quite well for many years, many decades in some cases, got together and decided just pure as a matter of interest to think in really quite a lot of detail about what would a complete alternative to the diagnostic model look like. So 
This is I and Mary Boyle, a psychologist, we're the lead authors, and the other authors are psychologists and two survivors, um, Jackie Dillon and Ella Longdon, who from our collective clinical research, personal and survivor experience, we've all, you know, spent our lives saying the diagnostic model doesn't work and we need alternatives and thinking about and practicing and you know researching and trying to produce alternatives. So we had a very solid starting point as a group, but it was an extraordinarily difficult task because one of the things we realized as we went on is that even though we all thought we'd left that stuff behind, these are very deeply ingrained ways of thinking which go much further back than psychiatry itself, much further back than medicine. It's, it's about a whole way of thinking you know, which you can trace back to the Enlightenment, which you can trace back further than that. So we had to do a lot of sort of philosophical unpicking because what we really didn't want to do was end up with something saying, instead of using this word, we'll use this word, you know. We wanted to go very, very much further than let's have a different kind of label. So we've ended up with something that is vast and sprawling and on the website, We'll put the link up, I think. You can see that the main document is 200,000 words long. Good news is you don't have to read it, but it's a kind of massive overview of all the relevant biological, social and psychological causal factors, along with a lot of other conceptual and historical stuff and um, consultation with service user group and so on and so on. So in a sense, it has to be that long and that detailed and that dense to be on a solid foundation, because if you're challenging the diagnostic model, you're challenging something very, very big with roots that go very, very deeply. Yeah. Um, but in another sense, um, what we've ended up with is, I think, a form of common sense. And interestingly, some people have responded in that way. They said, but this is common sense. And actually, I think it is. Actually, it's about, you know, instead of asking what's wrong with me, ask what's happened to me, which is kind of trauma-informed survivor slogan and actually it's I mean it's it's most of it isn't new there's about 95 percent of it is is openly borrowed from elsewhere but we've put it together in a way that we hope provides a meta framework it's bigger than any particular model it's bigger than any particular approach so part of the aim is to provide extra support and evidence and validation for lots of really good non-diagnostic practice that's already going on that includes trauma-informed practice though we have some criticisms of that as well it includes formulation-based practice though we have some criticisms of that as well but it also attempts to go quite a long way beyond that and such that we can also accommodate you know all the ways in which human beings have for generations and for centuries across the world found to understand and heal distress which are actually very often narrative based and based in you know local social structures and cultural traditions and actually work a lot better than our failed diagnostic model which is being exported across the globe so like i said massively ambitious it's not a manual of do it like this do it like this set up your services like this you know do therapy like this it's a set of principles and our hope was that if, if anyone was interested they would take some of these principles and translate them into action in small ways larger ways evaluate them let us know how it goes and that in itself can feed back into the project and to do further development of the project so it's an ongoing process this is the stage two if you like and it's taken off beyond our wildest hopes really so there's some um, going to be Shortly, there's going to be about, well, in, in due course, about translations into five different languages. I've been to seven different countries. I did a tour of Australia and tour of New Zealand with the framework and with one of the other authors. And there's been, we've delivered hundreds of events collectively. And there are lots and lots of people in different ways taking the principles and using them to support, to enhance their practice, their thinking, their peer groups, their whatever, and in some ways to set up new ideas and new things as well. So as you say, rather than being a, a manual, it's a mm. way of reorienting your perspective and looking at the other that you're working with in, in a different way. It is that, yes, it's, it's a whole different worldview, but it's very much bigger than therapy. 
I mean, there are implications of therapy, but it's also about, you know, because diagnosis is so deeply embedded in our everyday lives, it's also about tentatively, you know, these are just suggestions, thinking about how could we commission and deliver and arrange our services in non-diagnostic ways? Yeah. How can we arrange for people to have access to welfare benefits without using diagnosis? How can we carry out research without using diagnosis as, as a starting point? It, it's all that kind of stuff as well. And yeah, and thank you for, for correcting me there, because what I liked about the book was that it it's accessible to anybody. You know, that it's not so, yeah. it's not just for clinicians. Anybody can pick this up um, and use it. You know, it's so useful just to the individual. But well, I, I'm glad you found that because yeah, you've reminded me to say yes. It's really not just about people who are patients or clients. It's about all of us because all of us struggle at times in a difficult world. So. And another point that you just made there, um, which. I hadn't thought of until you said it in that way is how that the existing diagnostic model is woven through our society in those really subtle ways you know when, when you said applying for benefit it, I hadn't even really thought about that mm. it's true isn't it it is true and I think that's kind of getting worse in a way so I, one of the things that particularly annoys me although a lot of things annoy me is the way that you know when I first started practicing the kind of assumption was there was a small group of people who were mentally ill most of them hidden away in hospital and that was all very sad but most of us didn't know much about it or think about it much and we've got to a position where it's like the whole population is trying to kind of medicalize itself we keep yeah. being all these ludicrous things like we all have mental health I mean what the hell does that mean yeah it means absolutely nothing it means we're all human beings and we all have difficult times but putting it under a mental health umbrella is just so so damaging because then we start talking about you know pills and therapy which can be useful at times but it's like we get miles away from ordinary human solutions and from looking at real root causes because if we're all got if we've all got mental health at the moment, whatever whatever that means, then something's <laughs> going badly wrong, isn't it? And it's the things that are going badly wrong that actually we need to look at. And we don't need to look very far. I mean, look around us at the impact that austerity measures have had on us, that COVID is going to have economically and in other ways for years, if not generations. We have reasons for feeling desperate and despairing absolutely we and need to come out of this as a fairer society because otherwise you know whatever it is that we call mental health is going to get worse not better oh god lucy don't take me down that rabbit hole because <laughs> of the rage yeah. that happens in me because <laughs> i work a lot as it sounds like you have um in your past with young people and what what i find is that uh, for, some, for some people we know, for some people, they really value having a diagnostic label. You and I might think that's misguided, but they, but they do, and we have to respect that. Young people, they really do want to explain their suffering, their difficulties, their struggles through that lens. And as you know, they'll be on the internet self-diagnosing, oh, I'm bipolar, and, and we'll get fashionable, fashionable yeah. diagnoses, won't we, as well? Yeah, well, we do. We do. I mean, I think it's terrifying. I think it's terrifying. And I actually think they're being brainwashed because you know, this stuff is not only everywhere in the media, but school educational programmes are being disseminated, which actually encourage people to self-diagnose and teachers to look for symptoms of mental illness. Yeah. Well, and I do. I give, I give training to professionals and a lot of teachers and lecturers about, you know, how to recognise struggles and difficulties around their students so you know you could say I'm part of that world in a way and I I feel sorry for teachers because you know I've got to have so many hats on these days yeah yeah I mean I I feel sorry for them they've got an impossible job and identifying struggles and difficulties great but then redefining these as mental health problems really not so good really not so good so one of the things that the framework is particularly interested is, and this is one of the ways in which it goes beyond trauma-informed practice as such, 
is thinking about it's called power threat meaning framework because power in our view comes first and foremost an awareness of the many forms of power and the way they impact on people is missing by definition from diagnostic understandings also missing from many psychological and psychotherapeutic understandings but power also includes what we've called ideological power which is the more subtle pressures expectations social norms very often driven by socio-economic interests very often not in the interests of the individual this is what has given us austerity and Brexit and 100,000 deaths from COVID at one level. So for many young people who might rightly say, you know, I've got a loving family, I'm getting a good education, you know, why am I feeling so crap? It must be because I've got this thing that everybody else says they've got or bipolar disorder or whatever. Actually, an analysis in terms of ideological power would make much more sense. You don't have to have had an identifiable trauma, and many people haven't. But look at the pressures our young people are under. You know, you work with young people. I, I have two young people. I mean, the, the pressures are horrendous, aren't they? They're pressures on education, their worries about their future, their pressures on their families, you know. Their pressures by social media, their pressures to look, you know, behave, have a certain lifestyle. You know, who wouldn't be feeling absolutely desperate and comparing themselves to all and feeling they were failing and feeling awful about themselves? And it really is no kind of answer to the pseudo explanation of a kind of it's because I'm bipolar or it's because I've got depression. And, and I, I want to go back to the word power because mm. in some ways that's a very loaded word and I'm not I'm glad you kind of began to expand on that because you know I don't think I don't think a lot of people understand what we mean when we talk about power you know we, we, we think about that quite negatively maybe someone having power over us or someone being big and strong and then we're really small and weak so you know, I'm glad, as I said, that you began to expand on that because I, I think that that's really not understood in its wider context. No. Well, necessarily, in a way, in the framework, we've focused more on the negative aspects of power because that's what tends to be at the root of distress. Yeah. Obviously, power itself is neutral and obviously power can be helpful and people like us are trying to use the power we have gained through our training and experience positively and protectively as our teachers, as our parents. But if we think about the role of ideological power, it's very much in the, in, you know, in some people's interests and maybe interests of societies as a whole to conceal from us, from ourselves the impact that Power is having very negatively on us in many ways to tell us, you know, we ought to be happy and we ought to feel like this and we ought to be able to achieve this and so on and so on, so that we end up blaming ourselves and so that the more subtle and insidious forms of power are not obvious to us. And from the framework point of view, imposition of a psychiatric diagnosis is a, a, one of the prime examples of ideological power because the diagnostic model does not have evidence to support it. It never has had evidence. It is backed up by a great many powerful interests, not least the drug companies, but also professions and you know, many other sources that benefit from the ability to label people and to some extent disconnect their distress from the circumstances of their lives. And it paves the way for further abuses of power. You know, take these drugs or else we'll make you take them, you know, uh, agree with your diagnosis, otherwise we'll give you a worse one. And that's how people end up as long term patients. So, I mean, at one level, I agree with you when you say, well, young people and anyone can define themselves if they like. They can call themselves bipolar if they like. They can call themselves whatever they like. So we're not about stripping labels off people and indeed labels are needed for some purposes in our diagnostic based society. But another level, should we ever be telling people this? Well, actually, uh, in the framework, we don't think so. We've got a sentence about is it scientifically, professionally or ethically justifiable to tell people they have these mental illnesses as though it were fact, because it's not a fact. And as professionals, 
whatever people want to take from what we say or what they read, we should not be telling them that. We should not be telling them that. Well, also, uh, lots of thoughts firing off in my head, but I think, as you said in one of your presentations, it creates this kind of circular argument. You know, why am I feeling like that? Oh, well, because yeah. you're bipolar or whatever. And, uh, well, how do you know I'm bipolar? Well, because you're feeling like that. Exactly. You're, you know, and... and, and exactly. Um, as, as you know, um, with one of your colleagues, uh, John Hendon, it, we've set up um, a campaign against the overprescribing of uh, psychotropic meds. Mm. And uh, as a side shoot of that, we've been getting people's personal stories. Mm. And, and, and I will preface this by saying, yes, that these are from the extreme end. Um, but, you know, one of the sinister things that's kind of emerging is when people get trapped in the system and mm. because they're being, being given a diagnosis of psychosis or whatever then then nothing that they say is taken seriously at all yeah 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 oh I, I find it really frightening and very distressing yeah but I don't think that's the extreme I think that's the routine I think that's what psychiatry is well, that I don't just mean psychiatrists as a profession I mean the system that is what psychiatry is and does. That's routine. That's actually what it's about. You know, that first moment when you, as I sometimes frame it, walk into a meeting with a professional, you go in as a person with a problem, you come out with a patient with an illness. That's probably the biggest turning point in your life and nearly always not in a good way. And you do get sucked into this cycle. As soon as you accept this definition of yourself and your difficulties and take on this identity of mentally ill, everything follows kind of almost automatically it's very difficult to get off that treadmill and people don't know that we talk about informed consent no people do don't. not realize the repercussions of that when you go in that door no they don't of course they don't i mean how should they you know they're experts they're highly trained you know of course they don't i mean the two survivors who contributed to the framework jackie dylan and Ella london are quite well known nationally internationally and for very in various ways um they were lucky enough or determined and or determined enough to decide i don't have to see myself in this way but many people aren't lucky enough to come across those options eleanor was lucky enough to meet a psychiatrist who said to her i don't want to hear that you're schizophrenic i want to find out about you as a person and that was a huge turning point for her so there's a common story there's a common theme in the stories of people who often identify as survivors who've escaped the psychiatric system in that they came across something or someone, sometimes a book, you know, sometimes a self-help group where they realised, I do not have to buy this crap. If I may put it like this, I, 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 can, dunk, I can junk this. You know, it doesn't mean they don't have problems. It doesn't mean to say there isn't a long, hard road ahead, but I do not have to define myself in that this way. And actually, that was what was keeping me trapped. And I think when you're suffering, though, um, you you have so you feel as though you have so little resources. Mm -hmm. um, you, you you maybe don't trust yourself, and it's mm -hmm. very hard to advocate advocate for yourself in in that way, isn't it? And and to challenge. Oh, it's very hard, and I you know I wouldn't necessarily advise people to go around saying that to their. <laughs> I, I wouldn't I would say say what you need to say to get by you know so, and I better I better add because you know I get a lot of you know back cash on social media etc I am I'm really not saying that nobody finds mental health services helpful that you can't see yourself in a diagnostic way if that's helpful to you but for many people it isn't helpful and for virtually nobody is it a choice and at the very 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 least it ought to be a choice and we, and we we bandy this idea of informed consent about and actually that that yeah, really is no, there's, no, there's no there's, there's no such thing in I mean there's virtually no such thing in relation to drugs in relation to psychiatric interventions in general. Yeah. So uh, there was one other aspect of reading your book that I wanted to pick up on, which is the idea of culture. Mm. because it's kind of again it's something we hear all the time it's in our training you know respect other cultures and what and cultural differences and yet 
this whole diagnostic model really doesn't take into into account at all <laughs> any other cultural world view. Does well, it? That's a very interesting point. It's true. We all want to be culturally sensitive. And at the same time, what happens when it comes to diagnosis? It's like, here's our special Western scientific knowledge and we're going to export it to you and persuade you it's the right thing. You know, so it's, that is a very interesting paradox. And I think the global mental health movement, the movement for global mental health is one of the bigger scandals of our age because it is involved in exactly that. And I'm sure not saying nothing good comes out of it. And I think some of it's very well motivated, but it is about exporting our catastrophically failed model, diagnostic model that doesn't even work in the westernized settings in which it was developed across the globe to replace, often in the very simplistic forms, all sorts of, you know, culturally appropriate forms of expressing and healing distress, which at the very least are going to be no worse than ours, and often very, very much more helpful. It's an absolute scandal. And a psychiatrist called Suman Fernando has des described this as another form of colonialism. And I think he's yeah. absolutely right. You know, it's not about invading someone's countries with tanks, but it is about colonising people's minds with the magic Western scientific medicine. You know, Western scientific medicine has an awful lot to offer, but it's not medicine in psychiatry and it, it has nothing to offer to, to cultures that are lucky enough to escape it and very little to offer to our own culture. Well, it's very insidious because you're, you're saying this is how you should behave. And if you don't yeah, behave yeah. within in this norm, then then there is something wrong with you, pathological, yeah, pathologically yeah. wrong with you. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I um, for my master's, I studied um, people that hear voices. And oh, yeah, and uh, very, very fascinating for me. Um, and I looked at a lot of uh, shamanic and indig indigenous cultures. Mm. And to pick up, I mean, my listeners will get bored with me keep going harping on about this, but from a, from a uh, from those kind of more tribal communities, those indigenous communities, they look at say somebody that that might be diagnosed here as having a psychotic episode, as being actually marked out as somebody very special. Mm -hmm. It means that the spirits have visited you, you mm -hmm. and you go through this, yeah, crisis of breaking down, that you, you get transformed and you are very much valued and have a useful position in society as a result of that. Yeah. But over here, those very unusual experiences will have been um, diagnosed as, you know, historically schizophrenia or psychosis, um, certainly pathologised. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a lovely way of looking at it, isn't the Indigenous perspective? And I think to say, is that true or not, is kind of irrelevant. It, it makes sense within that culture. And within that culture, it is clearly a very positive way forward for that person. And actually, to say, as we might in the West, oh, well, it shows you've got schizophrenia. I mean, this is not a more evidence-based statement than saying this shows that, you know, you're getting messages from your ancestors or something like that. It's our, our version of that, which we dress up as though it's a scientific truth. It isn't. But more, more than that, it's extremely damaging because as you, it introduces us into a lifetime of shame and stigma and toxic chemicals. <laughs> which are not going to be good for mind or body. Yeah. It's interesting how we do seem to be reclaiming some of that knowledge, don't we? So there is a wider acceptance that voices can have meaning, can be productive, can be helpful for some people. But, I mean, there's a, an awful lot of residue of pathologising around as well. Yeah. And, and it's almost, what upsets me is this, almost this kind of looking down as though those cultures are less than or don't have any wisdom. Oh, yeah, no, it is. Oh, it is. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it, it is colonial, a colonialist mindset. It is. It absolutely is. So the other thing um, that made my ears prick up, um, I don't really know what question I'm asking you here, but I wanted to mention it, is because you were really brave, I thought, in one of your talks 
bring in the idea, and you only touched on it briefly, bring in the idea of spirit possession. Mm. And I don't hear that talked about as, as, a, as an issue much at all in, the, in my professional circles. The only way that's even begun to be spoken about is um, in, the, in the Muslim culture. And they talk about the yeah. jinn and uh, evil eye. And I actually went to a clinical psychologist who was a, a Muslim and she was um, giving a, some training on how to define, you know, where does, and again, forgive the, the terminology, but that was the terminology she was using. What is a mental health issue mm. and, and what might be in their traditions considered, you know, a, a negative expression of, of gin being involved in your life and they take it very seriously. So I just, I wondered what you might say about that. Well, if we step outside the kind of diagnostic model, then we can be open to all sorts of explanations that may make sense to people in their particular social and cultural context. So I guess my view would be we don't have to see this as bizarre and some bizarre, primitive, exotic, culturally specific belief that people without the benefit of our wonderful Western knowledge, you know, may still be struggling with, even though they're wrong. <laughs> I mean, I would say, well, that's a particular kind of narrative. And if it works, makes sense that I mean, that's fine by me. It should be fine by any of us. You know, and there are some of those understandings are around um, in the UK and you know, other westernized cultures. So we have things like the Spiritual Crisis Network who, uh, who support people who feel they're undergoing something akin to a spiritual emergency rather than a kind of psychotic breakdown or something. So, yeah. I mean, personally, I'm open. I don't know if people can be possessed by spirits or not. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't really mind. But I, I think if that's a narrative that makes sense, then fine. I would think we should be supporting that for people for whom that makes sense if it seems to be constructive and helpful for them. Yeah, and I guess where I come from with that is if we're open to, to someone's meaning making, then we invite any view in. Well, well exactly. And that's what the Voices Network does, of course, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, if you go to a Hearing Voices Network meeting, say, this is spirit possession, they will say, well, fine, tell us about it. Is that helpful? Yeah. How are you managing it? And does it enhance your life or other aspects of it that are difficult for you and so on? Yeah, absolutely. Does does the way you make meaning of that, how does that support you and how, how is that not so helpful, maybe? Well, that's the important question, I think, not whether it's in some sense true or fits into the accepted dominant yeah. explanations. Yeah. So in a wider sense, what, what feedback have you had? How has this been uh, received? <laughs> well... If you believe in ideological power, you would expect a powerful backlash from challenging dominant social structures and the interests that support them. So there's been quite a, a backlash, although it's, it's hard to say how much, you know, how there are on social media, voices can be amplified, even if they're don't, not widely representative. So there's some quite unpleasant backlash. And the reason I know it's backlash rather than constructive debate is because a lot of it consists of very personal abuse towards me. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes of a very misogynist nature, even from professionals tweeting under their own name, which is quite shocking. But I mean, more broadly speaking, it, it's been, you know, there's been a huge amount of interest. And, you know, we, we, our policy is to kind of push it open doors, if you like. So, I mean, all of us involved in the framework of people who spent a lot of time trying to introduce change into systems that don't really want to change or only a certain amount. So our policy for this was we hadn't got a strategy for it's not about rolling it out or it's about saying here it is if you're interested let us know and we'll do what we can to support you. So almost by definition we've been engaging with the people who are interested but there's an awful lot of them. There's an awful lot of them which is fab and I think I'd like to think that that's partly because it's such a wonderful framework. <laughs> but, you know, I think we've done a pretty damn good job, although it's an imperfect and evolving framework. But I think it also speaks to the, 
the widespread recognition that what, what we're doing isn't working. We need something different. There's a very widespread, there's a hunger for something different. Yeah. And framework is not an answer. I don't think there is an answer, but it may be a step along the way to where we need to go. Absolutely. I think you should be very proud of it indeed. So um, you're, you're a trainer and a speaker. So mm. is this really what you spend the majority of your time kind of training on or, or what, what does that mean? Yeah, almost entirely, yes. It's kind of become my job in a totally unexpected way. So I gave up my job in the NHS at the end of 2016 and, and this is what I'm, I'm doing you know, along with others, kind of writing, training, and I do training in some other stuff as well, but the framework's become the main thing. So I'm having a lockdown. <laughs> Not, hasn't been a huge amount of fun, but it's been productive work-wise. <laughs> no, and just looking at some of your um, videos on YouTube, it looks like you do a lot across Europe, etc. I, I have done quite a bit, yeah, and I was due yeah. to go to Denmark and Spain, last year but of course I couldn't but so frustrating yeah you know we will be able to do that again at some point I hope yeah and so you're a speaker as well so uh, tell me about your audience you know who's there is it very diverse or or is it just professionals or well well it's whoever asked me really so I've done one or two quite big open events, you know, for 400 people in Dublin, for example. I've done quite a lot of events for professionals, although I always like to have a mixed audience if possible with service users as well. I've done some much smaller things. I've done quite a few podcasts. I mean, I, you know, I just wait to see who's going to ask. I've done some more specific training events for particular services or organisations about how they might you know, look at their organisations and services a bit differently. So what, what's your message? What do you, what's the one thing that you want people to take away from listening to this? You mean this podcast today? Yes. Um, be very sceptical about the diagnostic model. <laughs> Find out a bit more about the pros and cons and the alternatives because you know these are important issues and make up your own mind but actually these are important issues that affect all of us and they're going to become more important not less important and you know any of us as professionals as family members as friends are going to come across people who touch the mental health world in some way so it is something we will need to do some thinking about so if people want to um experience some of your training um or or contact you or or find out a bit more about you lucy wh what's the best way um, for them to contact you um well i'm on linkedin and uh i'm on twitter at clinsight lucy I'll, I'll send you these links or i have a i have a work email address and i'll, I'll send you that so you can put that, put that up as well Great, yeah. And I mean, uh, when I was just doing a bit of research uh, for this podcast, I went on Google Scholar and there's there's plenty on there, that you, papers that you've written, books that you've contributed to. Um, so that was a mine of information in itself. So thank you very, very much for giving your time today to talk to us. Not um, at all. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, and I wish you well and absolutely keep up the good work. Thank you. It's very much needed. Thank you. Hi, everyone. If you like asking questions like me, please like and subscribe. Thank you.